You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host, author, and occasional misanthrope, Juliet Miranda. Go to theunwritablerant.com and you can subscribe on iTunes or connect with the show on Facebook and Twitter. Hi there, y'all. It's Juliet Miranda. Welcome to episode 97 of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. It is drinking time, y'all. That means it is time to grab your glass, fill it up, raise it up, and toast. Cheers, y'all. Whoa. Oh, that is one hell of a whiskey. Y'all, I have finally broken down. After hearing so many stellar reviews and people telling me, you gotta try it, you gotta try it, I finally caved and I bought a bottle of Whistle Pig Straight Rye Whiskey. This whiskey is 100-100. That means it's 100% rye, and it is 100 proof. This whiskey has been aged 10 years, and I gotta say, I kinda get what all the hype is about. Now, I'll admit, I was a little skeptical about buying the Whistle Pig. Rye whiskey is just getting more and more popular by the hour. And since my personal preference is for the more corn and wheat-based bourbons, I wasn't entirely sure I would enjoy the Whistle Pig, particularly for the price tag, which is definitely pricey. At about 89 bucks a bottle, you had better like what's in this thing. But I'll tell you, it's good. It is really, really good stuff. This is a really multidimensional drink. And I find myself really surprised to say that because it is truly just 100% rye in the mash bill. Right off the bat, it hits you with this incredible vanilla flavor. It's got this incredible floral sort of flavor to it, and you definitely get the impression of Red Hot Candies. This drink is definitely mellowed out by adding some ice to it, which is what I've done, and I think that really helps bring out some of the more caramel flavors to it. Now, I can't say this is going to be my preference to drink on its own, but I have a suspicion that this Whistlepig rye is going to make one hell of a Manhattan. And that's what I'm going to be hanging on to it for. If you are a fan at all of rye whiskey, then you absolutely need to check it out. If you're like me, however, and more of a bourbon kind of gal, you might want to stick with something more like Templeton. So I am happy to report that despite several semi-drunken tweets to the contrary, we did not die in Michigan. That's where my guy and I have been for the past several days drinking with our friends in the woods, around a bonfire, and on the beach, and it was an absolute blast. We were all over Michigan over the 4th of July holiday, but there's one place in particular that I want to tell you about. A bar. I know, I know, big shocker that I would wind up in a bar. But this isn't your ordinary bar. In fact, I use that word with the loosest possible definition. Because the howler monkey, that's what this establishment is called, is not exactly a bar. There are bars, there are dives, and there are shitholes. And then there's the howler monkey. It's not located on any real sort of road. It's more hunched over in a cornfield somewhere in the wilds of Michigan. I suspect it was built sometime around the Civil War, and the cornfield just grew around it naturally. This is definitely not the kind of place you would stop at deliberately, despite the whole welcome biker sign out front. At one point in time, the howler monkey was made of wood. But over time, the wood disintegrated, leaving behind what I can only assume are the spores of mold that have fused into a substance that only resembles wood. I'll tell you, this place is standing purely on sheer willpower. And if you think I'm exaggerating, just check my Instagram page. There's a photo of it. It's not pretty. The inside resembles the outside, really, in that there's no distinguishing the two. What's left of the ceiling is essentially styrofoam and sheets of plywood. They only serve two kinds of booze, beer in a can and beer in a bottle. Occasionally, if you're lucky, the bartender will bring in a bottle of whiskey and pour it into little wax cups for you. But I'll tell you, it was really weird. The place just felt really familiar to me which is kind of disconcerting since I usually require the places that I frequent to at least have working plumbing. But I'm looking around, I'm taking in all of my surroundings, 
And it dawns on me what it is that I'm recalling. The howler monkey reminded me of the clubhouse that I built when I was eight. My best friend Bobby and I made it that summer. He lived across the street from me, and despite being a year older, he was my best friend. We spent the entire winter that year planning our clubhouse build, drawing elaborate plans, waterproofing sheets of cardboard with garbage bags, and hoarding every roll of duct tape we could find. We built our clubhouse alongside a giant tree in the prairie next to my house. It was the perfect location. The tree afforded us a little bit of stability in our structure, and the prairie grass surrounding the area was taller than us, so it made the clubhouse nearly undetectable. Sure, it leaned to one side, and we essentially had to rebuild it every time it rained, but it was the perfect place for two kids with plans to rule the neighborhood to hang out. It was where we hatched the plan to smoke bomb the yard of the grouchy old lady down the road, which we did and never got caught. And it was also where we plotted to blow up the plumbing of the elementary school, which we did not do, by the way, because we weren't lunatics. I taught Bobby how to make M80s in that clubhouse, and he taught me how to play dice. It was kid heaven. And fully stocked with Fangoria magazines, cherry bombs, and bags of Doritos, which I truly believe are the most glorious summer junk food ever invented. And the clubhouse was all ours for one whole month, because that's how long it took before other kids found it. Now, Bobby and I had an unspoken rule that we would never bring anyone else into our clubhouse, although we both did. My few girlfriends weren't especially impressed. And the ones who saw potential just wanted to play house there, which I was definitely not interested in. That was the trouble with my girlfriends. We all played pretend back then, boys and girls alike. But where I enjoyed imagining castles and battles against mythological predators, all the girls I knew wanted to do was pretend shop, pretend cook, and pretend mother. And when I did play along with them, all of my attempts to infuse a little bit of fun into the games like pretend stove fire or pretend runaway meatballs, I would inevitably be ousted from the group. That's just the way we played back then. So you can see why I much preferred the company of Bobby. I wasn't much at sports, of course, but I made a great partner in crime when it came to schemes and plots. Unfortunately, the other boys in the neighborhood never saw it that way. I was a girl and at the time, that was tantamount to being a pestilent leper. It didn't matter that I could shoot a BB gun better than any of them. My so-called place was with the other girls. So while Bobby and I were great friends on our own, peer pressure is one hell of a bitch, particularly for a boy who is nine to my eight years. And that is exactly how dickhead Dan Barkis was able to weasel his way in and commandeer our clubhouse. Dan wasn't exactly the neighborhood bully, but he was a kid I avoided on general principle. He was prone to snatching toys from smaller kids and returning them bent or broken. And his big fun came in riding his bike just close enough to your back tire to throw your balance off without ever actually touching you. And there, one late July morning, I found him in our clubhouse. It was our habit, Bobby and me, to meet there after breakfast every day. It was my favorite thing to do. It really was. Every morning, I would rush my way through breakfast, cramming my mouth full of Wonder Bread toast and sucking back some orange juice before running out the front door and into the prairie. And Bobby was always waiting for me. Except that particular day when I opened the clubhouse door and saw dickhead Dan staring back at me. This is my clubhouse now, he says. Dan was the kind of kid who worked purely on intimidation. He wasn't even all that much bigger than any of us. And now that I think about it, I don't even remember him ever actually beating anyone up. But there was something about the way that he would look at you. It just made it seem like it was in your best interest to do whatever it was he wanted. I look over to Bobby for help, and he just shrugs his shoulders. The traitor. I knew he was just as powerless as I was but that didn't make his betrayal hurt any less. And oh, how I wanted to cry right then. All the injustices of kiddom were staring me in the face. The bully, the traitor, and me, 
all battling for ownership of a pathetic little clubhouse. I can feel my eyes starting to well up a little bit, and I sniffle, and dickhead Dan just pounces. You gonna cry, baby? It's a taunt that every kid heard at least once a week in my neighborhood, and it never ceased to suck. Dan just seizes on my weakness. Why don't you just go home, little girl? I didn't have much of a choice. I mean, really, what was I supposed to do? I hadn't yet developed the gumption to fight back physically, and it's not like I could have reasoned with a kid. But I'll tell you, I wasn't going to let dickhead Dan or Bobby see me cry. So I sucked it all up, and I just said, fine, I'll go home. But I want my firecrackers, and I want my magazines. Despite the imbalances of power, some things in my little kid world were sacred, particularly horror magazines and firecrackers, and we all respected that. Bobby gathers up my stuff and hands it to me, avoiding my eyes the whole time. It was the single most awkward kid divorce in history. I look around at the clubhouse then in something of a farewell gaze and catch sight of the door. We had only just put that door up the week before, and we were so proud of it. We had fashioned it out of a refrigerator carton my dad had brought home from work, just for me. And I'll tell you, it was the perfect finishing touch to our fortress. Screw dickhead Dan, I thought. I didn't want him to benefit from our work, so I say, I'm taking my door, too. Well, Dan starts to protest, of course, but I had caught him off guard. So I reach out and I yank that door right from the cardboard support wall we taped it to. Maybe it was my anger at the situation, or maybe I was just too reckless or careless, but in my attempt to rip that door off, I managed to take the entire wall with it. And with that, most of our little cardboard clubhouse came tumbling down around us. Dan is yelling up a storm and calling me all sorts of rat fink and Bobby looks as though he now wants to cry. I really wanted to feel proud about taking a small stand against Dan. I wanted to be happy that now he wasn't going to get to play in the clubhouse either. But really, I just felt sad. Somehow, I knew that we would never rebuild that clubhouse. And that brings me back to the Howler Monkey. My friends and I had lucked out and were able to secure a round of Jack Daniels in little paper cups. We situated ourselves on some very rickety folding chairs and around a wobbly card table. The bar was packed. There were some rather dusty-looking balloons and streamers on the walls for the 4th of July, and men, women, and even a dog were all gathered around drinking, talking, and laughing together. I took it all in, and I had to admit, the howler monkey certainly wasn't much to look at. But damn it, I wasn't about to deny anyone their clubhouse. And with that, I'm raising up my drink and I am toasting to the howler monkey. Cheers, y'all. Huh. <laughs> this whiskey is just so potent. You know, I think I'm going to stash this bottle away for the winter. I have a feeling right around January or so, it's going to taste really, really good. You know, I'm surprised I can drink anything at all, considering the amount of booze we put back with our friends in Michigan. It takes years to develop the kind of group dynamic we have. It's the kind that allows you to spend four days drinking at a cabin in the woods with another couple and not wind up like Jack Torrance. And yes, I do realize that most normal people do not use The Shining as their litmus test for friendship. That's just how I roll. Really, adult friendships are hard to come by. Every so often, my guy and I get it in our heads that we should expand our friendship circle, maybe try to find another couple to hang out with, and we always, without fail, regret it. We did this recently, in fact, with a couple that we had met through some mutual friends. They invited us over for dinner, and I wanted so badly to turn them down. It's not that I didn't like them exactly, but we didn't know this couple very well. And it really just seemed too soon to be doing something as intimate as visit their home without at least one other couple to serve as a buffer. My guy tends to feel, until proven otherwise, of course, that my social conventions are at best outdated and at worst absurd. 
people can just hang out, he says. It's not like we're dating. But what he doesn't realize is that meeting a new couple is just like dating. And as such, it very rarely works out. I got my first suspicion that I was very unfortunately right about this when we pulled up to this couple's house. And I saw that their home included a very large stained glass unicorn window. It stood almost as tall as me and took up one entire half of the front room window bay. I looked at my guy and shook my head. He knew what I was thinking. You see, I have this theory. Generally speaking, you can break the entire population of the world down into two sides. Unicorn people and non-unicorn people. I am not a unicorn person. Oh, I tried a sip of that ridiculous Starbucks unicorn concoction when it was out. Pretty much for the same reason that I will occasionally stop and look at roadkill. And it tasted like molten clown. Now I realize this makes me something of an awful, judgy sort of person. And I swear I really did do my best to shake it off when walking into their house. But wouldn't you know it? Things just got worse from there. For starters, I was not greeted with hello or nice to see you, but instead with, we take our shoes off in this house. Oh, do you? Had this couple's house been carpeted in rose petals, hand-sewn with virgin hair by nuns in Italy, I might have cut them some slack. As it was, their carpeting was standard issue, a little threadbare, and currently being traversed by two cats, a dog, and one cage-free iguana. So I wasn't especially inclined to take my shoes off, thank you very much. But my guy gives me a pleading head shake when he sees me getting that up yours kind of look and just says, please, please behave yourself. It is awkward enough trying to find your way through a stranger's house. And now I have to do it in my bare feet, all the while dodging little balls of dried cat barf and iguana dung. I can feel my feet sticking to the floor as I moved from the living room into their kitchen. This is where the unicorn guy proudly announces that he has made us pizza from scratch, crust and all. Well, I'm excited when he says this, because as someone who likes to cook, I think that I've found some common ground for conversation. So I ask him, how do you make your crust? Unicorn guy's eyes widen, and he actually looks insulted by my question. He tells me it's a secret recipe. I think he's kidding. It's a fucking pizza crust recipe, not the address of Oliver Cromwell's head. No, really, I say. Is it corn or flour-based? And again, I get that insulted stare. The entire room goes silent. Unicorn guy is not budging on this. So now even the iguana is giving me a dirty look, making me not only the asshole who didn't want to take her shoes off, but the asshole who tried to crack the stupid pizza crust code. As it turns out, that's the least of this couple's oddities. Over the course of the night, we find that the unicorn couple has dozens upon dozens of weird and arbitrary tattoos that they are more than happy to impose on us. For example, when we presented them with a bottle of wine to go with dinner, we learned, we don't pollute our bodies with alcohol in this house. During dinner, my guy was informed that we don't put used forks on the tabletop in this house. And after using the restroom, I was told, we don't flush number one in this house. It seemed that my guy and I couldn't do or ask anything without the response being sandwiched between we don't and in this house. Until it came time for entertainment. Because in that house, guests can't leave without playing a few rounds of charades. Oh yeah, I just said charades. A game that hasn't been played since Nixon was in office. The unicorn couple was so into charades that they had even made their own deck of word cards for it. Because of course, we like to make our own fun in this house. So we squared off couple against couple. My guy's competitive spirit kicks in immediately. Not so much because he enjoys playing charades, but because he enjoys winning. But really, 
my guy will get competitive over who can carry more grocery bags into the house at once. As for me, I was too busy watching the iguana slowly make its way up the unicorn print curtains to pay attention, so I missed the first few of my guy's pantomimed word clues. When I finally do tune in, my guy is furiously pointing at his head. I guess, gunshot wound? He rolls his eyes and keeps gesturing to the general vicinity of his head. So I try again. Concussion? Again, I am wrong. And my guy is getting more and more frustrated with my seeming unwillingness to understand his elaborate poses. By the time the buzzer relieves us of this nightmare, he appears to be reciting the Gettysburg Address. Top hat, my guy yells, as if I had somehow failed him in my wifely duties by not recognizing his tugging on an imaginary beard and wildly rubbing the air over his head as being a fucking top hat. The unicorn couple takes their turn next and guess the word penguin within seconds. They win that round, and the next several rounds after that, all with moves that were so perfectly choreographed and deliberate, I couldn't tell if they'd invented some sort of alternative body language in their spare time. Well, I had one very specific hand gesture I was ready to give these two, but since we only had one more round to go, I kept it to myself. My guy was up again. He makes the universal symbols for one word, three syllables. He starts by standing in front of me, holding his hands in front of himself, making fists. Boxing? He shakes his head no. Then inspiration strikes him, and my guy runs over to the front window and looks forlornly at his car. He presses his face against the glass as if he wants to leave desperately but cannot. And suddenly, his actions start making sense to me. Hostages? My guy shakes his head no, but indicates that I am close. He then begins to motion around the room. He points at me and the outside, and I begin shouting out words like trapped and captive, all words that clearly describe exactly how I felt sitting there in that unicorn couple's home. My guy's building up, and his actions are becoming more and more clear to me. And as he fakes an attempt to gun down the unicorn couple and break out of the house, it is clear that we are sharing a little private joke at their expense. By now, I know exactly what his word is. But I am having way too much fun watching my guy pantomime wrapping a noose around the life-size unicorn sculpture's neck to call it out. The buzzer goes off, several seconds early, I suspect, and I yell out the magic word. Prisoners! Oh, I was right on the nose, and it did not go over well. Unicorn Gal spits out a couple of words about how, in that house, guests are always polite to the host, but I didn't really care. They showed us to the door, and my guy and I made a break for it. It's not that they were bad people. Maybe they didn't mean to come off as condescending jackweeds with all of their in our house bullshit. And who knows? Maybe if we were drunk or stoned or it was the 18th century, perhaps charades would have been a fun way to pass the time. What I do know is that I treasure the friends we have so very much. And if I ever see another goddamn unicorn in their house or otherwise, it'll be too soon. And with that, I'm going to have a little whiskey and toast to the friends that we do have. Not a unicorn person in the bunch. Oh, there we go. Whiskey. Well, I think y'all have heard enough out of me. Thanks so much for listening to the Unrideable Rant podcast. Don't forget, you can always hook up with me on Twitter. Let me know if you've got any bourbon suggestions you want me to give a try. And remember that I will be back again with more stories next Sunday. Until then, cheers, y'all. Go to the unwriteablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. You can hear new episodes of The Unwritable Rant on RadioVegas.rocks every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern and on IPMNation.com on Saturdays and Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern. 
and hear best of episodes every weekday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Girl, you as pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make our way up to Bourbon, a couple hurricanes and a hand grenade and get blown away. Let the chips fall where they may. It is all the same, what you say, bon ton. Hey, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this